Hello everyone, Ron here from LTL Tutoring Central. And today it's Reading Comprehension Day. I'm going to be reading an article. It's called A Century of Science Fiction That Changed How We Think About the Environment. It's a long title <laughs> to jot it down. That's why I'm reading it. Um, I'll share my screen in a moment. I'm going to be reading the article directly from the site. So you're going to see the advertisements and everything just as if you went there. And you can do that because in the description, I will put a link to this article. So you can go and check it out for yourself if you like. Uh, you can follow along as I read it. And uh, I might have some comments as we go through. It's quite a long article. So I may just read all the way through it and uh, just give a few little comments because <laughs> it's going to take me some time to read through anyway. Afterwards, however, feel free to comment uh, if you're watching on YouTube in the comment section or ask questions, uh, whatever you like. Uh, of course, like the video, give it a thumbs up if you do like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, push that little subscribe button. It's been growing uh, a little bit in the recent weeks, so that's super. Uh, let's keep that going. Let's keep the channel going so that I can keep making videos and posting. I usually post once a week on this particular channel, So, uh, and all different things. This, this is the reading comprehension one, but you can check out the playlist. There's playlists for collocations and idioms and storytelling and uh, you know lots of playlists to check out if you want to do that, or just check out the individual videos videos and come back every now and again. Uh, the subscribing doesn't cost a penny. It just costs one or two joules of energy to push that button. And uh, if you want to help some more, check in the description. There is a way to donate to the channel. All right. I am going to share my screen now. And here we are. This is from Pocketworthy, but the article is from MIT Press Reader, written by Cheryl Vint, and it's called... A century of science fiction that changed how we think about the environment. Even before the idea of climate change took hold, sci-fi began to think of the planet as something that preceded our species and could conceivably continue without us. <clears throat> it has become axiomatic to say that the world is becoming like science fiction, from mobile phones that speak to us, reminding Star Trek friends of tricorders. I don't know if you remember Star Trek, but I do, the, the early one, <laughs> first one, to genetically modified foods, to the Internet of Things, and the promise of self-driving cars, people in industrialized nations live immersed in technology. Daily life can thus at times seem like visions from the pulp science fiction of the 1920s and 1930s, either a world of perf either a world perfected by technology manifested in events such as the 1939 World's Fair with its theme, The World of Tomorrow, or a dystopian nightmare such as Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Yes, Brave New World, amazing book. I love that book disturbing but amazing if we think about science fiction or sf in terms of the genre's connections to pressing issues in 21st century culture no topic is more urgent than climate change and the ways it promises to transform all aspects of human life from where we live to how we cultivate our food to what energy sources will fuel our industries yes of course climate change is um in the forefront of a lot of people's minds including politicians and scientists trying to figure out what to do. Uh, the issue is so pressing that some have started to use the term cli-fi for climate fiction, but this faddish coinage obscures a longer history of science fiction's engagement with the environment and leaves unexamined the question of why science fiction has proven such a valuable genre for thinking about environmental futures. Even before the idea of climate change took hold, the genre embraced the geological and evolutionary timescales of 19th century science and began to think of the planet as something that preceded our species and could conceivably continue without us. Such conceptualizations of the planet as a changeable environment turned the tradition of apocalyptic fiction toward mundane visions of environmental catastrophe instead of divine judgment. <clears throat> I should say, a little break here <laughs> as I'm reading this. Uh, this is the very first time I've read through it. I, I found the article, looked at the title, looked at it a little bit. I have not read through it. So if I stumble on words, etc., you'll know why. Uh, I'm just doing my best on a first time read here. And yes, of course, the, the planet and there was some kind of environment long before humans came along. 
uh, and uh, whether there is after we go, I don't know yet. Uh, I, I don't think I'll be here. And so how will I know? A key early way such ideas cir circulated was through the changing imaginary about Mars. Imaginary? I think that's a mistake. M imagery, maybe it's supposed to say. In the late 19th century, telescopic observations seemed to suggest the planet was covered in canals, which American astronomer Percival Lowell hypothesized were an irrigation technology, an idea taken up in Edgar Rice Burroughs' A Princess of Mars, 1912, among other fictions. When this idea was disproven by better telescopes, science fiction often depicted Mars as a once inhabited planet whose civilizations had died out due to drought, uh, pres presaging a fate that might also befall Earth. In Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars uh, Trilogy, 1993 to 1996, about terraforming Mars to create an atmosphere and enable human colonization, technology is used to make these canals a material reality. The trilogy represents the viewpoints of several different factions over the decades-long process of changing the surface of Mars, including characters who argue in defense of leaving its environment unchanged. This is the best-known science fiction series about engineering planetary environments, most of which express themes about environmental protection and sustainability, but some of which celebrate a fantasy of total human control over the environment and planetary weather. So, yes, uh, another little break from the reading here. Yes, what do you do if you, if you do go to another planet? Um, should you, or should humans, in other words, uh, change what's already there, whether or not there's life there? Is, is, is this something that we should or should not do? <clears throat> and especially, I think I would, I, I would think it's much more complicated to answer that question if there is some form of life there, even if it's just... Uh, uh, very small bacteria or, or or plant life. Early science fiction offered spectacles of disastrous destructions of cities and their populations, but unlike more recent works, did not posit anthropogenic causes. Disease rather than climate was more frequently imagined as humanity's end in these works, including Mary Shelley's The Last Man, 1826, and M.P. Shields' The Purple Cloud, 1901, I don't think I'm familiar with either of those. At times, such tales of massive destruction serve as opportunities to remake society without much environmentalism, such as Sidney Fowler Wright's Deluge, 1928, in which existing cultures are wiped out by earthquake-induced floods, distilling remaining populations into a hardier strain. This motif begins to take on a more environmentalist orientation in later works such as John Christopher's The Death of Grass, 1956, about a mutation that kills all cereal crops, a device that draws attention to humanity's dependence on other species, a theme also present in George R. Stewart's Earth Abides, 1949, in which current humanity cannot survive, but the planet can. And of course, um, and they may say more about this as I read through, as I say, I haven't read it, but I'm just thinking here about genetically modified um, organisms, uh, uh, plants and things. It becomes uh, very dangerous, I think, for us to limit the number of uh, and the variety of grains and cereal grains, things like that. Uh, anything really, any other kind of uh, plants that we use you know, for food. And if we limit the variety of them, then uh, there's much more chance, in my mind, that a disease could take out vast portions of our food system. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's there's a there's a balance there, or there's a question there about how far should you go in in limiting? Because the more GMOs that come out, it narrows and narrows and narrows the variety that's being planted and grown, and uh, the others may not be available when we need them or if we need them. Here we go, back to this article. Such works are interested in how the remnants of humanity might restore civilization and what form it might take, and thus remain anthrop anthropocentric in their focus. They are notable, however, for their emphasis on connections between humans and the natural world, resisting a technophilic tone of much contemporary science fiction that envisioned extensively mechanized futures. Moreover, they stand out from other contemporary 
post-apocalyptic fiction in positing a premise other than nuclear war for the end of life as we know it, and in explicitly linking images of destruction to environmental themes. Ballard's vivid depictions of the monstrosities inherent in industrialization, capitalism, and colonialism evoke topics that would usually be addressed in work by activist authors. With the more experimental science fiction of the new wave period and its relationships to contemporary countercultures, uh, I looked away, I shouldn't have done that, and overtly environmentalist science fiction appears, although here too fictions of apocalyptic collapses are sometimes more metaphorical than literal. This is especially true of J.G. Ballard's stylistically compelling disaster novels, The Wind from Nowhere, 1961, The Drowned World, 62, The Burning World, 64, and The Crystal World, 1966, each of which depicts the world destroyed by what we would now call climate change, high winds, flood, drought, and a mysterious force that crystallizes matter respectively. I haven't read any of those. They sound good, though. Ballard uses his transformed setting to interrogate the sterility and violence of the world prior to these disasters rather than comment specifically on environmental themes. Nonetheless, his vivid de uh, depictions of the monstrosities inherent in industrialization, capitalism, and colonialism evoke topics that would usually be addressed in work by activist authors. At roughly the same time, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, 1962. I have heard of this and saw um, documentaries, I think, about this or interviews. A trenchant critique of the use of pesticides in agriculture, which opens with A Fable for Tomorrow, in which Carson depicts a future where a blight destroys all life in any town USA, an outcome that Carson traces back to disruptions in the ecosystem caused by pesticides. Carson thus demonstrates the rhetorical power of fictional futuristic depictions to shape public understandings. In attempts to discredit her scientific credentials and disparage her personal character, Carson's opponents were as vociferous and vile as any uh, but. <laughs> Ballardian antagonist. Nonetheless, her work alongside the Club of Rome report, The Limits to Growth, 1972, published a decade later, fostered new ways of thinking about ecological futures premised on sustainability. And you will have heard sustainability used a lot in recent years and uh, the last couple of decades. Silent Spring energized a contemporary environmental movement which had significant overlaps with contemporary anti-war and anti-nuclear activism. The first Earth Day was proposed in 1970, aimed at making air and water pollution a mainstream public concern and eventually resulting in the creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the passage of legislation related to pollution and endangered species. So you can see how... Uh, fiction uh, effects uh, sometimes can can get into the public's uh, mind, a collective mind maybe, and, and change things on the ground as well. Earth Day drew on the science fiction Im imaginary, both, why does it say imaginary? It seems it should be imagery, both in terms of Carson's use, use of futuristic narrative and in the image of the planet as seen from space as a symbol on a flagged designed by John McConnell, which was intended to convey the interconnectedness of all life on the planet. The turn toward imagination as a powerful rhetorical technique in the environmental movement is also apparent in the launch of the Whole Earth Catalog, a, a countercultural magazine started in 1968 and published until 1998, which also featured an image of Earth from space on its first cover. Indeed, this is the whole Earth of its title. An early example of do-it-yourself activism, the magazine fostered an imaginative community oriented toward an ideal of living more sustainably, addressed in this way to the inhabitants of that future. Oh, there's a picture of Whole Earth Catalog. Not a particularly good picture of Earth, but... <laughs> As with feminism in the 1960s and 1970s, environmental activists turned explicitly to science fiction and its relationship to the utopian tradition to promote countercultural values. The most famous example is Ernest Kallenbach's Ecotopia, 
1975, written as if it were the notebook of William Weston, a journalist who in 1999 is visiting and reporting on a society in the Pacific Northwest that seceded from America to establish a new polis defined by sustainability, recycling, minimal use of fossil fuels, localized food production, and gender equality. It's a long list there. Like the authors of 19th century utopias, Kallenbach demonstrates an imaginative possibility for how one might li live otherwise. Moreover, the novel suggests that changed relationships to environmental ideals require transformation of other aspects of social life, such as patriarchy and capitalism, themes that persist in ecological science fiction today. Similar ideas uh, about the need to address problems of poverty and discrimination alongside pollution and environmental destruction are found in fiction by Kim Stanley Robinson, unquestionably the most important living science fiction writer addressing environmental themes. Now, I don't know about this Pacific Northwest Society, but I have heard and seen documentaries and, and read information about other groups that have tried to uh, be more environmentally friendly and also solve some of the other social uh, problems that we have. And sometimes they seem to work on a small scale for a short period of time, but I think we're a long way from uh, solving the issue. And I think a lot of them tend to go back and try to try to do something that they thought was being done in the past. And the two problems with that is, uh, I think that probably 7 billion people or whatever are not going to go back. And if they did, it would probably be environmentally disastrous. And secondly, uh, it probably wasn't the way they thought it was anyway. There's, there were a lot of problems back then too. There are then dystopian works of environmental science fiction, such as John Brunner's The Sheep Look Up, 1972, taking its title from a line in Milton's, uh, I'm going to pronounce that wrong, Lycidas? Lycidas, Lycidas I think. About, I like Milton too, I don't know why. About hungry sheep failing to be fed by a corrupt church, the novel scathingly critiques the entrenched capitalist system that simultaneously destroys the environment and markets production markets products designed to ameliorate the risks caused by contaminated air, water, and food. The plot concerns Nutripon, a manufactured food sent to developing countries as part of an American aid package. A shipment causes hallucinations that result in violent behavior, and some believe this is a deliberate attempt to eliminate people of color. Meanwhile, in the United States, money is less and less able to insulate the rich from contaminated food and water. Finally, we learn that Nutripon shipment was contaminated by toxic waste in the factory's water supply, an accident. In a world of irresponsible polluters who value profit above all else, a conspiracy is not required to produce genocide. Brunner's work stands out for its global scope and its recognition that the damage done by colonialism continues in and is exacerbated by pollution. Frank Herbert's Dune, 1965, is often understood as a prescient novel about climate change, given its desert setting and its invention of several technologies for survival with a minimum of water. It is the first novel, it is the first novel in, I should say there, what would become a sprawling franchise. Yes, Dune is quite popular. Recent movie out not too long ago, and there's an older version. It wasn't quite so good. And then, of course, the book, which I read many, 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 many years ago. The original novel recounts the political uh, machinations by which young Paul Atreides, 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 I think it is, is displaced from his inheritance as a feudal colonizer of Arrakis, Li lives among nomadic indigenous peoples while mastering psionic powers and eventually reclaims his dynasty, which while also fulfilling a messianic prophecy. Alongside Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, 1961, I think I read that a long time ago too, in which a libertarian, free-loving, promoting, free-love-promoting human comes to Earth from Mars, Dune was read widely outside of science fiction circles when it was published. Heinlein's strange protagonist, Valentine Michael Smith, preached a hippie-like philosophy best expressed by the novel's invented term Grok, that is, comprehension so intense as to approximate union with the object of attention, a phrase soon widely used beyond science fiction. Both novels were embraced by a youthful college audience who saw in them a reflection of their own anti-establishment values. 
well, and there's a lot of anti-establishment values, um, although I use the term values very loosely here, <laughs> are going around today. The, the, uh, nothing wrong with questioning, nothing wrong with looking for a better way, but sometimes the anti-establishment ends up being far worse than the establishment, and it becomes a new establishment that's, as I say, even worse. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. Just destroying everything is not actually solving any issues either. <laughs> um, but the shift from pollution to climate change as the main engine of dystopian uh, futures doesn't firmly take hold until the 21st century. The explicit turn to science fiction as a tool for environmental activism characterizes the second generation of writers who often write fiction about climate change and are involved in activism. Let me scroll up a little bit. I told you this was a long one. Uh, I may say this name wrong. Uh, Wanuri... I'm not sure how to say Kahayos. Not sure. Important short film, Pumzi, 2009, depicting the regeneration of a future Africa after a period of intense environmental law, shows the power of new voices taking up these themes. Another prominent example is uh, Paolo Bacagalupi, sorry for slaughtering your name, who addresses the uneven global effects of climate change. His Young Adult Trilogy, Shipbreaker, 2000, uh, 2010, rather. The Drowned Cities, 2012, and Tool of War, 2017, is set in a world of change by sea level rise and projects both growing economic uh, precarity and the rise of authoritarian governments in such circumstances. Uh, back Bakigalupi's most forceful novel to date is The Water Knife, 2015, based on a short story originally published in the environmental magazine High Country News about near-future water wars as California, Arizona, and Nevada all battle to control the dwindling resources of the Colorado Basin. It is mainly an indictment of legal manipulations that keep water rights in the hands of an elite portraying with sympathy the fraught ethical choices left to the disenfranchised, and it concludes with a glimmer of hope in green technologies distributed by a Chinese government that is mostly in the background of the narrative. Okay, I'm not familiar with these stories. Or they, again, they sound very interesting and very good. And, uh, the article here, I would say just for my students, if they're writing uh, papers, when you have, and I've noticed this earlier as well, but I've forgotten which one, when you have a, an acronym or a short form like YA, the first time it's always good to spell it out and then put the uh, acronym or short form in parenthesis um, because uh, some readers, although this is widely used, it, it still does make it easier for some readers. So they, in my opinion, they should have done that. <laughs> oh, there's some pictures here. Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents. Octavia Butler, I may have to check some of these stories out. I love science fiction. I just uh, haven't read any for quite a while, and I know that I haven't read a lot of these. They sound very good. All right, back to the article. Octavia Butler's Parable Series, 1993-1998, is a truly prescient work about climate change. One of the few writers of color to achieve prominence in the field during the 20th century, her reputation has only grown in the years since her death in 2006. In this series, she imagines a future California beset by massive displacements fueled by climate change. Although published more than 20 years ago, these books read as plausible futures, perhaps now more than ever. Unlike Bakigalupi's despair, Butler's novel is rooted in hope, although she depicts an equally grim future. Like her Xenogenesis series, this work demands of its audience that we confront the difficult task of building communities in the face of loss, displacement, and tensions about diversity. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure that I'm talking, and I haven't read this these stories, but I, I will. Th it just brought something to mind that I've been thinking about for quite a while, and talking with some some people, and you know. Even if we somehow magically went to net zero or 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 stop using fossil fuels altogether, you know, and that's not going to happen. That that, that cannot happen without killing off <laughs> tons of people. Um, but even if we did, uh, climate change is still going to happen because that engine is already going down the tracks and it's not going to stop very quickly. So. We do need to think about 
how do we change? Where do we move people? Some some areas are, are not going to be livable anymore. Some islands already, I think, have that have already had that effect, and there will be more and more <clears throat> as we go along, no matter what we do. Uh, so at least that's 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 the way I'm reading the science, and that's what I'm I'm hearing is that it, you know, it, it's a thought that we stop, but we cannot completely stop. And even if we did, it's going to keep on on going for quite some time after that. So, so that sounds sounds like a little bit like what she's talking about there. The parable series imagines a future religion. God forbid. <laughs> he says colloquially, Earthseed as the core of this new kind of community. As Shelley Streeby outlines in Imagining the Future of Climate Change 2018, Butler's work has inspired activists, some of whom have formed the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network, to cultivate the values Butler espoused, treating her science fiction as a manual for alternative life ways, what Streeby calls a place to practice the future. Streeby connects this network to other instances of imaginative activism in 21st century environmental politics, particularly by people of color and indigenous communities showing powerful ways that science fiction is becoming a rhetoric for activist practice. So interesting again to see that connection between uh, fiction and uh, what's happening on the ground in, in the real world. Uh, Butler's vision insists that environmentalism must proceed in tandem with other social justice movements that counter racism and colonialism, a perspective that also informs N.K. Je <clears throat> Jemison's celebrated Broken Earth trilogy, the most important recent work to address climate change and social injustice as mutually con constitutive problems. Kim Stanley Robinson has written about the environmental damage caused by capitalism throughout his career, generally offering the hope that technology can ameliorate our dire situation. Climate change is most centrally the focus in his near future science in the Capital Trilogy, 2004 to 2007, about the struggle to mobilize politics and science together to confront the inevitabil inevitability of climate change. It's tricky to read through such a long thing on first first try. <laughs> the first novel, 40 Signs of Rain, 2004, focuses on structural barriers that bar research and legislation that could address climate change. And it ends with the spectacle of a flooded Washington, D.C. The second novel, 50 Degrees Below, 20, uh, 2005, is set during a mini ice age caused by the halting of the Gulf Stream. And it explores possible technical options to ameliorate this changed climate. A lichen engineered to capture more carbon, resalinating the ocean to restart the Gulf Stream, and various tools and clothing that enable a high-tech Paleolithic lifestyle with a smaller carbon footprint than the life ways of urbanized uh, modernity. But how many people had to die to, get, to do that? Uh, the final novel, 60 Days and Counting, 2007 offers the utopian possibility of an elected U.S. president who will prioritize climate change and who institutes a set of policies that push the U.S. economy into sustainable energy, while acknowledging the global disparities that are the legacy of capitalism. Um, the article could have used an editor, actually, <laughs> just saying. Uh, it's a very good article, but there's a number of errors. A number of the technological amelioration projects succeed, and we are left on the cusp of a new chapter in history. Yeah, that's very utopian, I think. Uh, um, coming up on uh, U.S. elections, uh, who knows what will happen. Uh, not quite as positive, no matter which way they go. It's not as positive as this, and if they go one way, it's definitely not as positive as this. Uh, appearing about the time that Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans in 2005, we can see in retrospect that the trilogy addresses issues of extreme weather, just as we can see now that Katrina was only the first of what has since become the new normal for the climate. Heat waves, cold waves, and extreme storms. The vast scope of his work speaks to Robinson's careful attention to the complexity of climate change and the institutional barriers that prevent even acknowledging this reality in some circles. Yes, there's a lot of people still denying that it's even happening or it's happening, but it has nothing to do with human endeavor. <laughs> um, and both, both incorrect, by the way. His wide cast of characters enables readers to see how politicians, lobbyists, funding agencies, displaced migrants, and families in America are all part of the network that informs how climate change is perceived. 
The utopianism of Robinson's conclusion seems a bit forced, perhaps, but he is careful to show the number of people and institutions that must come together to enact meaningful social change, as he refuses to simply capitulate to the cynical despair that fuels uh, Bakagalupi's work. Although perhaps not self-evidently a climate change novel, Robinson's Shaman uh, 2013, set during the last ice age and recounting how early humans adapted to a changing climate, further reinforces his ideas about the value of elements of Paleolithic ways of living with rather than in opposition to one's environment. Possibly, I haven't read it, but again, Billions of people must die for that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, maybe, maybe not what we're looking for. Uh, science fiction is a genre that has long used its projected other worlds to offer commentary on our material and contemporary one, especially to remind us that this world is open to change. There is a myriad, there is myriad evidence that authors from outside the genre use science fiction techniques in precisely this rhetorical way. Consider Naomi Oreskes and Eric M. Conway's polemical The Collapse of Western Civilization, A View from the Future, 2014, <clears throat> written as if by a Chinese historian in 2393, who is reflecting back to theorize why Western civilizations failed to act, despite clear signs of their looming collapse. Uh, well, Western civilizations, but China needs to react as well. <laughs> Similarly, popular books such as Alan Weissman's The World Without Us, 2007, and the documentary television series Life After People, 2009, encourages us to reflect on how humans have changed our environments as they offer speculative visions of ecosystems continuing without us, erasing the technological signs of human habitation. Or consider Werner Herzog's strange environmental film The Wild Blue Yonder, 2005, which is part documentary, part science fiction narrative, fused with NASA footage of outer space, deep sea photography, and a scripted narrative about an alien species who destroy their ecosystem and seek uh, to relocate to Earth. Sounds interesting. Although sometimes I have difficulty uh, sort of totally getting engaged with something that is such a mixture. I sometimes like his nonfiction or fiction, and sometimes the overlap is okay, like historical fiction or something. <laughs> but sometimes the speculation, that I think part of the reason I have issues with that is that a, a lot of people take it as factual when in fact it's, it's made up. Uh, some of the, I don't watch the, the history channel i i watch tv in a different way now anyway but some of the things were, that were creeping in i thought this is not actually <laughs> true this is just these are just made up stories uh environmental rhetoric like speculative design an approach that encourages thinking about and designing possible futures in a meaningful way is one of the main places we see science fiction become a discursive way to grasp the present Lindsay Thomas, in a compelling article on preparedness discourse, argues that science fiction provides a counter discourse to the kinds of speculative projections found in disaster planning, including government projections about climate change. Whereas documents such as the Department of Defense 2014 Climate Change Adaption, Adaptation rather, Roadmap, cited by Thomas, cultivate feelings of neutral detachment and automated response to already anticipated scenarios. Science fiction about climate change enables readers to experience multiple temporalities beyond the individual human life. Preparedness discourse responds to change, understood as disaster through strategies of containment, but science fiction offers something more. It offers us a way of thinking and perceiving, a toolbox of methods for conceptualizing, intervening in, and living through rapid and widespread change, and the possibility to direct it toward an open future that we remake. Yeah, some very, very interesting, uh, solid points made throughout, uh, and uh, you know, lots of titles that you might want to look up if you're interested in reading science fiction, uh, just for the science fiction component, but also maybe to see how it relates to what's going on today in our current situation. Also, what some authors thought of in uh, the distant past when they were writing science fiction, and and they're going to hit on some things that seem really relevant today, and then. There's going to be a lot of misses as well. We tend to, or a lot of people tend to focus on the hits, saying, 
isn't that incredible? They must have been a prophet. No, no, no not really. <laughs> Read about, you know, the 90% of things that have not come to be <laughs> as well. So it was, after all, written as a fiction. Uh, but it is interesting to see what, what might have come. And then the more recent fiction, of course, is using what they, they know and what has been happening. You know, environmental issues have been around for a long time. Climate change, too, has been around for a while now. Uh, I remember as a child, and I'm I, I'm no kid now. Uh, you know, lots and lots of concerns about pollution and the environment. And um, I remember a lot of people being concerned about the next ice age. Now we're sort of looking more at uh, the Earth becoming too warm, but that can create uh, colder temperatures in some areas as well. So I guess not completely gone but but not definitely not the ice age anymore we're looking at hotter temperatures all the time and the seas warming and the ice melting and so the opposite of what the concern seemed to be back then uh cheryl vint is professor of media and cultural studies and of english at the university of california riverside she's the author of several books most recently most recently science fiction from which this article is adapted so you can always check her out and check out that book if you have time or want to and i'll i will put a link to this article below in the description uh i'm going to scroll all the way back to the top it's a long way and then i'm going to stop my share screen so a century of science fiction that changed how we think about the environment i will stop share for a moment and come back to the big screen. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting article. There's a lot we could talk about, but I think that's this is going to be a long enough video. So we'll do the discussion down below if you want to comment or tell me what you think. Uh, like the video if you did like the video. I hope you did. And subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It doesn't hurt you at all. And it helps the channel a lot and uh, motivates me to keep making videos and, and keep this thing going. LTL Tutoring Central is definitely going to keep going. This is uh, We're just entering into the 28th year. Uh, I, I am LTL Tutoring Central. You can see behind me this sort of looks maybe a bit messy. But, you know, uh, in-person tutoring happens at this big table. You can't even see the whole table in the video. And uh, that's Shakespeare up behind me here, open to Sonnet 19, because I'm going to do something with that for personification in a little while. Uh, so lots going on at LTL Tutoring Central. If you're interested in that, check out the website or just email me and uh, ask me all about it. I do online lessons as well. Uh, I've taught people from all over the world, Japan, China. I'm in Canada, uh, United States, and um where else? Spain. I don't know. A lot of different countries. I just talked to someone from Atlanta, Georgia the other day. And yeah, so it's it's great what we can do with technology today. So as some things are going in the wrong direction, some things might be going in the right direction, but then there's arguments about all of that too. So <laughs> lots and lots to talk about. Uh, I think that's all I'm going to say about this particular article. Uh, in terms of you, I wish you a very good day. I am looking actually down here because I have to look to see where to stop the recording. And uh, I don't do this that often. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not smooth. Anyway, it's Ron from uh, LTL Tutoring Central. Until next time, keep learning, keep having fun. Bye-bye for now.